He was born in Parma, Ohio in 1928, then raised in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He grew up fascinated with rockets, but his family could not afford to send him to the elite colleges that taught rocketry. He went instead to the Naval Academy, settling, he thought, for aviation instead of outer space. He flew twice during Project Gemini and twice in Apollo, and was on his way to the moon when an oxygen tank deep in the heart of his spacecraft exploded. He is James Lovell, and he is a legend of air power. James A. Lovell was born outside of Cleveland in Parma, Ohio on March 25, 1928. His family moved soon after to Milwaukee. His father died when he was only 12. Lovell and his mother, left alone, formed a tight-knit family unit that scraped by. Lovell was fascinated by rocketry and as a student in high school he actually built a rocket with the help of some friends and a chemistry professor and uh, he launched the rocket and it did indeed fly about 80 feet up in the air whereupon it uh, exploded into what he described as a fabulous suicide. As the years passed Lovell's interest in rocketry did not wane. Entranced by the experiments of rocket pioneer Robert Goddard, he wanted to be a rocket engineer. I wrote to G. Edward Pendray, who was the secretary of the American Rocket Society in 1946, when I was graduating from uh, high school. He said, fine, go to MIT or Caltech. Well, I couldn't afford any of those things. Turned down by the Naval Academy, Lovell instead joined the ROTC and entered the University of Wisconsin. He studied there for two years, reapplied to Annapolis, and this time got in. My first desire when I got out of high school was to follow rocketry and just become an engineer. Uh, aviation was my second goal, and I really wanted to fly. And you always should have second goals. If you can't get the first thing, always look at the second thing. The Navy in the wake of World War II was changing. The battleships no longer reigned supreme, when the time came, Lovell applied for flight training, was admitted, and earned his wing. The Navy assigned him to night fighter training in California. In 1956, flying a mission at night off the carrier Shangri-La in the Sea of Japan, Lovell homed in a Japanese radio station instead of the ship's beacon and got lost. I had a knee pad that I had developed on the cruise over to Japan that would light up and when I, I had it plugged to the ship's receptacle and when I lit the knee pad up it blew all the lights inside the airplane, all the cockpit lights out, completely dark. Couldn't believe it. Lost, alone, out of radio contact with his home base and unable to read his instruments, Lovell seemed doomed. Looking around, he saw the pale glow of luminescent plankton churned up by the screws of the Shangri-La. With the wife and small children back on shore, Lovell followed the dim line, hoping it would lead to the Shangri-La. It did. He drove his plane down on the deck so hard, it blew two tires. The skipper of my team, <clears throat> very, very smart individual, put me on the very next flight. The next night, launched me off again. And that was the best thing in the world that happened to me. Soon after, Lovell requested assignment to the Navy's test pilot school at NAS Patuxent River in Maryland. He graduated first in his class and stayed at Pax River for four years. He was assigned to test aircraft, electronic systems, which involved a lot of flying in circles, painting different things on the plane's radar. Now, there are four test divisions at that time uh, at Pax River. Flight test, service test, armament test, electronics test. Everybody who graduates from test pilot school wants to go to flight tests. You check out all the performances of the aircraft, what it can do. Service test is not bad because you, you run the airplane and run it until you find out what breaks, what goes wrong. Armament test, well, it's pretty good. You find out how to drop the bombs and fire the rockets and shoot the guns. Electronics test, I mean, all you do is circle small cities around and check out the electronics and uh, the radar and things like that. That's the last thing I wanted to do. That's the first thing I got. In the aviation community, the hot topic was the inevitability of space exploration. The Russians had launched Sputnik, and the new American space agency, NASA, had announced Project Mercury. Lovell got orders to report to Washington for what was referred to as Spec Ops. 
when he arrived, he found himself in a room with more than a hundred other pilots. Spec Ops training turned out to be the first stage of astronaut recruitment. We went looking for possible candidates in a variety of areas, and there were certain possibilities. Well, some people suggested they should be race car drivers. They would have the right kinds of skills, and once again, coolness under pressure and so forth. Uh, they would be used to be taking a lot of risks. Uh, so there was some reason for that. But when you start looking around seriously, since sp flying in space is an adjunct of flying in the air, it makes a lot of sense to go look for pilots. And the ones who were doing high speed uh, uh, performance flying were all in the Air Force. So that's where we ended up going. Or I shouldn't say just the Air Force, but the Air Force, the Navy, and the Marines. This to me was almost the epitome of what I really wanted to do. I couldn't be a rocket engineer, I got into the Navy, I got into aviation, and then suddenly, suddenly what I wanted to do and where I was, because I had the right credentials to get into this program, met. 32 pilots passed through to the next stage, medical testing. Lovell seemed to be cruising through that until a lab test detected high levels of an obscure chemical in his blood. The elevated levels might mean something, or they might not. On a tight schedule with no time to investigate, the doctors sent Lovell home. Talk about a disillusioned young man, a naval officer, couldn't believe it. I was the only one, the only one out of 32 people that they, they, they flung. He returned to Pax River and his consolation prize, the F-4H Phantom. The Phantom was both the fastest and slowest fighter in the sky a highly maneuverable and slightly unstable aircraft that arrived with what was then a pretty impressive electronics package. You know, complicated, integrated electronic weapon systems. And so we were able to do quite a bit with the airplane. Uh, learned all about its radar, it was an interceptor. Uh, learned all about its performance. Uh, took it aboard a carrier. Uh, and so, uh, great time. The only electronics test pilot at PAX with substantial night fighter experience, Lovell was made project manager of the plane's flight test. It was great work, but it wasn't outer space. Two years after the first Mercury astronauts were announced, NASA put out word that it wanted more astronauts. Lovell reapplied, and his odd blood chemistry, which had washed him out of the first astronaut selection process, somehow seemed not such a big deal the second time around. In 1962, NASA announced that Lovell and eight others were the second astronaut class. I don't think we were too welcomed by the first group, and there was only seven of those guys, and we were nine of us. Uh, they took us aboard, but they, you know, they were looking at, well, you're gonna take our, our spots, and you know, of course, they were all senior. Project Gemini, the follow-up to Mercury, was a series of two-man flights designed to test systems and procedures necessary to land a man on the moon. Lovell was assigned to the backup crew on Gemini 4, which included the first American spacewalk. Lovell knew that after serving as backup, he was not far from going into space himself, and soon enough, his number came up. He and Frank Borman would fly Gemini 7, a mission that, if all went as planned, would set a space endurance record. He and Frank Borman were very hard-charging men, but they were also fairly easygoing. He and Frank were in a Gemini capsule, which was not exactly a spacious machine. In fact, uh, somebody described it as being about as big as the back seat of a VW Beetle. That didn't matter to Lovell, because it was the back seat of a Volkswagen in space, and space was where he wanted to be. The mission took off December 4th, 1965. Frank and I were so close together that uh, you, you couldn't stretch out. You could stretch your legs, but you had to bend your torso, or you could straighten your torso, but then you had to bend your legs. And uh, your top of your head was right at the top of the, uh, the hatch, uh, and uh, and, uh, you know, for two weeks with Frank Borman in the spacecraft was a real challenge in itself. They spent a lot of time joking with each other. Uh, Frank Borman would occasionally sing to Jim, put your sweet lips a little closer to the phone and we'll pretend that we're together all alone. 
and of course they were very much alone. A lot of the medical community didn't think that man could stay in space for two weeks. Uh, and that was the maximum length of time to go to the moon and come back again. We had about 23 experiments. We were doing everything to, to check, you know, the, uh, our blood volume and our heart rates, and they had all sorts, we were wired up for all sorts of things. On the 11th day of the mission, Gemini 7 and Gemini 6 rendezvoused high above the Earth. The maneuver, slow and imprecise by modern standards, nonetheless proved that it was possible to synchronize orbits in a way that would allow a lunar landing craft to meet up with its orbiting command module. Rendezvous and docking with, with two Gemini spacecraft in orbit, uh, those were critical components of us being able to successfully land on the moon. The mission was an overwhelming success. Lovell returned to Earth knowing that he had a good chance to be one of the astronauts chosen to go to the moon. After backing up Gemini 9, Lovell's next flight assignment was Gemini 12. The mission, flown by Lovell and Buzz Aldrin in 1966, closed Project Gemini with another rousing success. With the exception of a few minor mechanical failures, the flight accomplished its goals, and even the failures seemed encouraging. Assigned to dock with the Agena target vehicle without assistance from ground-based radar, Lovell succeeded even when his primary onboard radar failed. He switched without fuss to a backup system and docked right on schedule. Aldrin went for a spacewalk that proved that astronauts could not only float helplessly at the end of a tether, but they could also accomplish serious, challenging tasks in space. 94 hours after liftoff, Gemini 12 fired its retro rockets to return to Earth and plopped safely into the ocean less than three miles from its target. 28 minutes later, Lovell and Aldrin walked out onto the deck of the USS Wasp and Project Gemini came to a close. Back at NASA, planners were getting nervous. There were rumors the Russians were planning a moonshot for 1968, and the lunar module, which would ferry two astronauts from lunar orbit to the moon's surface, was falling behind schedule. Apollo 8, Lovell's next mission, had been planned as a shakedown cruise for the lunar module in Earth orbit. We had heard from intelligence that the Russians were going to put a man around the moon in 1968, and that was the decision that George Lowe had thought, well, maybe we can salvage Apollo 8 and uh, send it to the moon uh, and wait till Apollo 9 to test out the two spacecraft around the Earth. And that's how that all came to pass. Apollo 8 and its mission without a lander became the first uh, flight to orbit around the moon ten times during December of 1968. It was really uh, a very challenging and very intriguing mission to be on the backup crew, uh, to be any part of that, because it was the first mission that was going to leave the Earth and, uh, and reach the moon. On December 21st, 1968, Lovell, Frank Borman, and William Anders took off from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. After making a few checks, they fired their second stage and became the first people to leave Earth orbit. As we are getting towards the end of our training for Apollo 8, already realizing that this is going to be a lunar flight because Apollo 7 was successful, uh, we thought, what can we say around the moon? Because when we looked at our trajectory, we would burn into lunar orbit on Christmas Eve. Their first thought was, "'Twas the night before Christmas," but the wife of a journalist suggested instead that they read from Genesis. In what is without question one of the most moving moments in human history, the first people to look at the moon close up pointed a tiny television camera at the lunar surface and took turns reading to the whole world from the Bible. And uh, for all the people back on Earth, the crew of Apollo 8, have a message that we would like to send to you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and from the crew of Apollo 8, we 
close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on this good earth. With three trips into space behind him, James Lovell showed no disappointment when he was not named to be among the first to land on the moon. His time, he knew, would come. When Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walked on the moon, it completed what had been a kind of national obsession. From President Kennedy's audacious proclamation that the United States would put a man on the moon by the end of the 60s to the return of Apollo 11, the socially and politically polarized United States had been able to agree on little except the fascinating achievement of manned space travel. But once Armstrong Aldrin and Command Module Pilot Michael Collins returned to Earth, some of the public excitement about space travel seemed to dissipate. Apollo 12 seemed like a rerun. And by the time of Lovell's next flight, Apollo 13, the public's attention had started to roam. On April 11, 1970, Lovell and his crewmates, Jack Swaggart and Fred Hayes, lifted off. The mission was going well. Even mission control on the ground seemed blasé about man's third mission to the moon. The capsule seems in real good shape, Capcom Joe Kerwin said to the astronauts. We're bored to tears down here. Take off on that flight, April 11th, 1970 at 1313 Central Standard Time. We weren't superstitious, but maybe I should have been. Nine hours later, 200,000 miles from Earth, and outbound at a speed of nearly 25,000 miles, an oxygen tank in the spacecraft service module blew up, knocking out virtually all life support systems for the capsule. We didn't know what happened at first. I looked at Hayes and he didn't know what occurred. I looked at Jack Swiker, of course, and Jack was probably saying to himself, why am I on this flight? I was the backup. It was essentially an also ran of Apollo 11. And um, all of a sudden, when it looked like None of them thought they were going to get back alive. No one had ever been in so much trouble so far from home. There were three men 90 hours from Earth, utterly dependent on the lunar module, a self-sufficient pod designed to support two men for only 45 hours. We tried to close the hatch between the two vehicles, thinking that at first maybe a meteor had hit the vehicle. We weren't successful at closing that hatch, which of course is a requirement if you're going to make a safe landing back on Earth. Well, we tied the hatch down to a, to a couch, uh, and then uh, looking at the symptoms that were occurring because loss of all of our oxygen would mean loss of all of our electrical power, and then loss of our propulsion system. To preserve power, they cut consumption by 80%. The temperature in the tiny spacecraft dropped to the point where hypothermia became a very real problem. Lovell was the commander, and it was up to him to set the tone. It was up to him to keep everybody from going nuts. And uh, certainly, there were moments when none of them thought they were going to get back alive. So we had to start using all those crisis management techniques and good leadership on the part of the ground people and teamwork to get together to try to determine out what was wrong and use our imagination to figure out how to uh, take care of things. On the ground, engineers calculated small maneuvers that would keep Apollo 13 on a course that would slingshot it around the moon and back toward Earth on what is called a free return course. The solution was an emergency manual burn, a procedure deemed so unlikely that the emergency manual documenting it had not been included on the flight in order to save weight. But Lovell had been involved in the development of the manual. And as mission control watched in Houston, he and his crewmates powered up the command module, burned its engine for four and a half minutes, and got their craft online for Earth. Then we thought everything was okay because we thought we were back on the free return course and we had nothing going for us except the radio and a little fan to circulate the atmosphere. All the navigational aids, the guidance system, the computer, they were all shut down. Couldn't afford the electrical power. Uh, and then finally on the way home, Round tracking us said we were no longer on the free return course. Uh, and that we had missed the Earth's atmosphere for a safe landing if uh, we kept on this course. The pilot, who had once followed algae back to his aircraft carrier, aimed his spacecraft home using a primitive sighting device in the lunar module nicknamed the Exterminator. He had a margin of error for less than one degree in any direction. He nailed it, he nailed it. And that was using the Earth's Terminator the little gun sight we had in the lunar module window uh, to get in the proper position 
to use the lunar module engine to re-establish ourselves inside a very small two-degree pie-shaped wedge to get us into the Earth's atmosphere, which we did uh, by just brute force, uh, no autopilot to help us stabilize the, the vehicles. And both uh, Fred and I work in the spacecraft together, Jack doing the timing because even the clock was shut down. Got back in, of course, and the story, of course, is well known. Uh, we did make a safe landing in the Pacific Ocean, just about where we would have made the landing, but we arrived there several days early. It was described by NASA after the fact as a successful failure. And uh, it was certainly that. Um, I would take it a step farther and say it was a miracle um, and certainly a testament to uh, the people at NASA and their ability to put their heads together, um, to work the problems, and to come up with solutions to an incredible situation and series of events that uh, when you look back at it and you analyze everything that went wrong in Apollo 13, uh, which started obviously with the oxygen tank bursting and taking out a healthy portion of the command module and uh, went on to the problems with carbon monoxide, uh, the issues with the electrical system. When you put all that together, and you consider the fact that these are three men who are exhausted, who are frightened, albeit trained to control that fright, but are certainly probably 75% convinced that they're not going to get home alive. Um, you've got electrical failures, mechanical failures. Uh, the one thing you didn't have with Apollo 13 was human failures. I look at it like a now like a game of solitaire. You know, the, the game starts, you pick up a card. As long as you put that card someplace, the game continues. It's only when you pick up a card and there's no place to put it that the game ends. That never occurred on Apollo 13. We always had one more card that we could put someplace to keep the game going. This little tape recorder has been a big benefit to us in passing through the time away on our transit out to the moon. And it's uh, rather odd to see it floating like this in uh, Ed Odyssey while it's playing uh, the theme from 2001. April 13, 1970. The mood could only be described as relaxed. Apollo 13, man's fifth lunar mission. The third scheduled to land on the moon continued its tranquil coast. This is the crew of Apollo 13. We everybody there. Nice evening, and uh, we're just about ready to close out our inspection of Aquarius and get back for a pleasant evening at Odyssey. Good night. Uh, the sensation I had uh, that I had felt a vibration accompanying the bang, uh, not a large vibration or shudder. Is there any uh, kind of leads we can give them? Are we looking at instrumentation? Have we got a real problem or what? We're reading uh, zero N2 pressure in fuel cell one and 13 PSI on uh, fuel cell three O2 pressure. Okay, Barrett, what do you want to do? Open circuit fuel cell one and three? That's for important. Shut down uh, uh, the reactants valve and I uh, ask for a reconfirmation since uh, when you do that, it's sort of irreversible. If you shut one of these things down, they uh, uh, only can be restarted from uh, ground support equipment. Yeah, that's, that's because of the AC, and it looks to me, looking out the uh, hatch, that we are venting something. We are, uh, we are venting something out uh, into the uh, into space. Okay, let's everybody think of the kind of things we'd be venting. GNC, you got anything that looks abnormal in your system? Negative light. How about you, Ecom? You see anything that, uh, with the instrumentation you got, that could be venting? That's a firm flight. Let me look at the system flight as far as the venting is concerned. Okay, let's start scanning. Here is a bulletin from ABC News. The Apollo 13 spacecraft has had a serious power supply malfunction that could cause the lunar landing mission to be terminated early. I assume you've called in your backup ECOMs? Flight, say again. Have you called in your backup ECOMs now? See if we can get some more brain power in this We thing? got one here. Roger. At the moment, the astronauts are continuing to try to isolate their trouble. A late report says the spacecraft now is operating on battery power alone. All unnecessary equipment is being turned off. 
Okay, now let's everybody keep cool. We got the uh, limb still attached. The limb spacecraft's good, so if we need uh, to get back home, we got a limb to do a good portion of it with. Okay, let's make sure that we don't do anything that's going to blow our CSM electrical power with the batteries or that will cause us to lose the main or the uh, fuel cell number two. Okay, we want to keep the O2 and that kind of stuff working. We'd like to have RCS, but we got the command module system, so we're in good shape if we need to get home. Let's solve the problem, but let's not make it any worse by guessing. My concern was increasing all the time. It went from, I wonder what this is going to do to the landing, to I wonder if we can get back home again. Okay, Com, I'm coming back to you. Flight. Go ahead. I think the best thing we can do right now is try to power down. Right about then, it, uh, it was quite apparent to me that it was just a question of time that the command module was going to be dead. You don't want to get fuel cell pumps off, do you? We can do that on fuel cell number one flight. Okay, well, let's make sure we don't blow the whole mission. Well, the thing that concerns me is starting is throwing equipment. We, we had a problem. We don't know the cause of the problem. Flight, I, I've got a feeling we've lost two fuel cells. I hate to put it that way, but uh, I, I don't know why we've lost them. It doesn't all tag up. Network from flight. Flight network. Bring me up another computer in the RTCC, will you? Uh, we got uh, one machine on the RTCC, and we got dual CPs downstairs. Okay, I want another machine up in the RTCC, and I want a bunch of guys capable of running D-logs down there. Roger that. What all this means is only speculation at this point. First, though there has been some tumbling or rotation of the spacecraft, the astronauts do not appear to be in any immediate danger. I'll tell you what, uh, GNC, can you get somebody in the back room to try to figure out what the equivalent delta V is we're getting so that we can see if we can backtrack to see if we can figure out what's venting? Roger, we'll give it a try, Flight. Okay. When I looked up and saw both uh, oxygen pressures, one absolutely zero and the other one going down, uh, it, it dawned on me, and I'm sure Jack and Fred about the same time, that we were indeed in serious trouble. The only way to survive the situation was to transfer to the LEM. Flight Econ. Go ahead, Econ. The pressure in O2 Tank 1 is all the way down to 297. You better think about getting in the LEM or using the LEM systems. I'd say this is as serious a situation as we have ever had in manned space flight. We've always called the LEM a good lifeboat under those circumstances. If at any time in the mission, however, the LEM had separated and we had gotten ourselves into a rendezvous situation or uh, the, the command module being around the moon, then what you state is absolutely true. It would, it would be a fatal situation. Tell me you from flight. Go ahead, flight. I want you to get some guys figuring out minimum power in the LEM to sustain life. The accident had occurred 200,000 miles from Earth. Lovell, Swigert, and Hay. Since the command module was dead, except for the oxygen and power hoarded for re-entry, the guidance platform of Aquarius, designed to land on and take off from the moon, would have to be used. The first milestone, and I consider this after the accident, I guess, more or less the survival now, the first milestone was to get alignment on the LEM platform. Alignments are important, you know, because uh, without knowing exactly which way the attitude of the spacecraft is in space, there's no way to tell how to burn or how to use the engines of that spacecraft to get the, pro the proper trajectory to come home. In the position we are now on the Earth-Moon plane, we have to go around the, the, uh, the moon to get back if we're going to use the dipped engine. You would have had enough capability with the SPS engine, but of course we don't dare use that now. So we have to go to the back side of the moon and come back. To get into the correct orbit around the moon, the crew had burned out of a trajectory that would automatically bring them back to Earth. They would have to get back onto a safe course toward Earth. He needs to put his uh, throttle to men also, Flight. Throttle to men? Yes, he's at 29% now, roughly. This maneuver again was uh, completed on time, and because it was a manual burn, we had a three-man operation. Jack would uh, take care of the time. He'd tell us when to light off the engine, when to stop it. Fred handled the uh, pitch maneuver. I handled the roll, roll maneuver, and I pushed the buttons to start and stop the engines.
The Aquarius and you go for the burn. Forty percent. Okay, Aquarius, you're looking good. Auto shut down. The first problem was solved. They were back on the path to Earth. But there were many other problems to be solved. From a building at Houston's Manned Spacecraft Center, systems experts coordinated the coast-to-coast -coast effort to get the crew back. One of the big problems was consumables. There would be enough to eat and drink. But in space, there are other factors. Oxygen to breathe, electrical power to keep the spacecraft alive, water to cool the equipment and keep it operating. What we'll be doing till we get them back on the water is concentrating on everything that is de their, their lives are dependent upon at the moment rather than worrying about the accident because there's nothing we can do about that now. This, it appears at the present time that everything is under control and that uh, we have a safe situation at the moment. Hey, I want to say you guys are doing real good work. So are you guys, Jack. We are about 70 hours from home and... Uh, we think we have uh, uh, the situation in control. We've projected the uh, consumables, as I've described, and uh, we have a plan for carrying out the rest of the mission, but uh, uh, there's going to be no relaxation at all as far as that goes from now until splash. There was a key decision to be made before Apollo 13 went behind the moon. Where to bring them down? Their present course would take them to the Indian Ocean, where recovery would be difficult. A burn to bring them home quicker would take them to the Pacific Ocean near the recovery forces. Bringing them home even faster would place them in the South Atlantic, again away from recovery forces. It was decided to take them to the Pacific. We've run uh, these simulators both here and at the Cape and at the contractors that, uh, continuously ever since uh, last night. We've tried to simulate virtually everything that we've had the crew to do that, uh, that is non-normal that they've done. And uh, we've proven most everything that we've uh, been able to, uh, to run on the simulator prior to passing it up to them. There may be some detail we haven't done, but at least we've checked the feasibility of everything we've done, and we'll continue to do that. They passed 137 miles from the moon. For Lovell, it was the second time that he had seen the moon so near. But there was no time for contemplation. There was another critical burn coming. Okay, look, let's, uh, let's get the cameras put away. Let's get all set to burn. Yeah, one chance, though. And in Houston, the newsmen poured in to tell an anxious world the story. Shortly after Apollo 13 had separated from the Saturn third stage, the stage had been sent on to a trajectory toward the moon. Its impact would be recorded by the seismometer left by Apollo 12. By the way, uh, Aquarius, we see the results now from uh, 12 seismometer. Looks like your booster just hit the moon and it's uh, rocking it a little bit. Over. Well, at least something worked on this flight. I'm sure glad we didn't have a limb impact, too. Jim, you are go for the burn. Go for the burn. Roger, understand. Go for the burn. Guidance okay? We're good, flight. Control okay? We're okay, flight. Tell me. We're go, flight. Inco okay? We're good, flight. Ground confirms ignition. We're burning 40%. Bless Houston, you're looking good. Roger. Shut down. Roger, shut down. I say that was a good burn. Roger, now we want to power down as soon as possible. Understand. To conserve the electric power and cooling water, the crew shut down all but the vital life sustaining systems of the LEM. I think the LEM spacecraft's in uh, excellent shape, and I think it's fully capable of uh, getting the crew back. Uh, I think, as we have found before, every time we've put the LEM spacecraft to a test, it's always done much more than it was guaranteed to do, and I think this is a good case in point. 
Conserve the consumables, cooling water, electric power. The Lem water gun was leaking, and uh, we shut that off. Uh, I guess it leaked about a quart of water, I would, I would estimate. But it took me about two days to get my feet dry. And of course, it is, uh, I think you were all aware that the temperatures were going down in the both vehicles, and uh, uh, it's made for very chilly feet for a couple days. Lord, your astronauts will come back safe. If I may be serious for one moment and ask the entire audience for a moment of prayer for the crewmen of the Apollo 13. We'll hold silence for a moment, please. RCS A stands at 62% and B at 62%. I see we've gone a hell of a long time without any sleep. We're going to have to start thinking about getting people back to sleep again because uh, I, uh, I didn't get any sleep last night at all. The band lines were just slowly kept going down in temperature until I think uh, just prior to reentry, uh, it was down to about 38 degrees. And along with that, it was a, a sort of a chilling uh, coldness. The walls were perspiring, the windows were completely wet. And it uh, wasn't too healthy. I recall that we went in there to get some hot dogs one day, and it was like leaking into the freezer for the, for the food. You want my opinion on how they handled the situation when it happened? They handled it exactly like we'd expect some food. They were about as well on top of it as anybody could be with knowing what we knew, knew, which isn't very much, I'll have to admit. But I think they did everything right within the knowledge that was available to us in uh, a timely fashion, which is what uh, all we expect of them. I think they did a beautiful job of it. We actually had a third little sleep restraint, which Fred uh, then put on and buttoned up and kept a little bit warm. The astronauts faced another problem, their own exhaled breath. The lithium hydroxide chemical to take carbon dioxide out of the air was not sufficient in the lunar module. They would have to adapt the canisters from the command module to fit the hoses in the LEM. On the ground, an adapter was fashioned from materials the crew had available in the LEM. Cardboard from a checklist, plastic bags, and tape. After checkout in an environmental chamber, the directions for construction were sent up to Aquarius. At this point in time, I think the uh, partial pressure of carbon dioxide was uh, reading about 15 millimeters. And we constructed two of these things and put them online, and I think within an hour, the uh, partial pressure of CO2 was down to two tenths. So you see that uh, survival uh, uh, now became one of, uh, of initiative and ingenuity, and, and it was one which the ground continually helped us uh, along. We had all kinds of people on the ground trying to think of ways of, of extending our lifetime. There would be still another burn, a mid-course correction to get Apollo 13 into the narrow corridor through the atmosphere for a safe return to Earth. We're at burn attitude flight. College. Ignition. Thrust looks good. Shut down. Hang in there, it won't be long. 
there were moments when I didn't know how much consumables we had, whether we could make it back or not. But uh, uh, in a situation like that, there's only one thing you can do. You just keep going. And uh, you just keep thinking up where you can get more consumables. And uh, so that's exactly what we did. On April 17th, they prepared for re-entry. After a small course correction burn, they jettisoned the damaged service module. Uh, uh, uh. Copy that. Odyssey Houston standing by, over. Houston, we show you on the mains. It really looks great. Your mission served your country. It served to remind us all of our proud heritage of a nation, to remind us that in this age of technicians and scientific marvels, that the individual still counts, that in a crisis, the character of a man or of men will make the difference. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.